even with rising interest rates in the UK, it's becoming less attractive to investors as this crisis goes on. And therefore, I think we break through the parity in cable uh, before Christmas, uh, probably by the end of November. We need to get inflation under control. And un until that r happens, uh, we're going to see, I think, a lot of volatility in the marketplace in all directions. We expect to raise interest rates further over the next several meetings to dampen demand and guard against the risk of a persistent upward shift in inflation expectations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Parity play with the pound under siege. Traders increase bets at sterling will fall below a dollar. Market respite will Treasury yield stabilize after spiking yesterday. The Yuan slides as Goldman turns more bearish on stocks. Plus, the long unwinding road. Christine Lagarde says the ECB will only think about shrinking its balance sheet once rates are normalized. Now, let's check in on the markets. This is a picture across the board. Again, global markets remained on edge, but we're seeing uh, quite a lot of dip buying. The European stock 600 gaining some 1.2 percent. The FTSE gaining six tenths of a percent. This is the story, of course, of the week 10801. Although I have been told that in Leicester Square, of all places, if you're a tourist today, you actually get less than one dollar. So watch out if you're a tourist in London, your exchange rate or your bureau de change. The UK 10-year yields 4088. Um, it's also overall about to markets across the board, you know, really bracing for a heightened risk of global recession. So there's quite a lot of positioning underway. Now, the Bank of England and UK Treasury have failed in a joint bid to calm financial markets. And while the pound has actually rebounded slightly this morning, speculators are still increasing bets that sterling will slide below one dollar. This comes after a day that saw the pound drop to a record low against the dollar and gilt yields soar. We have a crisis in the bond market and a crisis in the currency market. An emerging market style crisis. A crisis of confidence. The UK lacks credibility in markets. You can't solve this crisis of confidence overnight. It's pretty clear that the BOE needs to step in. They will determine which way it goes. The Bank of England will have to do more. The Bank of England needs to hike interest rates by two or three hundred basis points. You need to be careful how you manage it. If they don't raise rates this week. If uh, the Bank of England doesn't come out in a very hawkish way. Sterling will probably take another hit. It's pretty clear that the markets are looking for parity. I think we break through parity in cable uh, before Christmas, uh, probably by the end of November. Right now, there aren't really clear valuation thresholds per se to point to. So we are looking at, at parity as the next big level. Well, to talk about the UK, we're joined by Lord Jim O'Neill, former Goldman Sachs Asset Management Chairman and ex-UK Government Minister, and Hannah Smith, Vice President of State Street's ETF Business. So thank you both for joining us. Jim, let's start off with you. When you look at yesterday's, of course, well, you came out with uh, all of the market moves and what you were saying. It was very clear that you called the budget naive. You certainly didn't mince your words. How do they regroup and reposition today? I don't know. Uh, if you look at the attempted soothing words from the bank and uh, Treasury overnight, um, it might be linked to why there's a bit of a calmer mood right now as we speak. But frankly, um, having had the experiences I've had since the very early 80s when I started in finance, the idea that each key player of the two players, Treasury, and the bank can sit around and do nothing till November about the impression they've created is for the birds. Uh, one, once markets home in on a problematical issue, um, it doesn't disappear unless there's a change in the issue that's got them concerned, with the exception as if the perception of, uh, of the concern turns out to be completely ill-founded. but. Uh, but so, Jim, give it, it, well, sorry. I mean, give, given all of this, is the BOE right to snub calls basically for emergency action? Well, it's a natural human. At the end of the day, all these people are human beings. So, <clears throat> particularly given the very murky politics of it, suddenly about the bank's independence, uh, I can imagine the last thing Andrew Bailey wants is to have to call an emergency meeting and have the government or some right-wing Tory members banging on about Bank of England independence. So he's probably praying that he can get away with it. But uh, if you look at the history of, 
emergency bank moves. That's what they often think. And it's events, dear boy, as it's said, um, that force policymakers to do things they don't want to do. But the idea that the bank can wait till when the World Cup starts before they raise rates on the back of this madness seems to me to be completely insane. So how much do you think, do you think that it's the government reversing or fine-tuning, i.e. abandoning some of the things they said, or is it that the BOE really has to step in? And if they step in, by how much? I mean, I think there's, two, there's slightly, <clears throat> two slightly different issues. I'm in, again, I remember talking to you, to you about this a number of times this year. <clears throat> the, the Bank of England has been one of the guilty participants of, of general central bank group thing about how long QE should go on for. And the problem is, is short rates are <laughs> grudgingly being raised by the bank, um, and they probably should have gone 75 last week. It's interesting that three members voted for that. And so they need to catch up anyhow. And now the problem is with this staggeringly, uh, let's call it to be polite, audacious budget, the bank looks even further behind. Uh, even though it now risks being intimidated yeah. by the government. So I think if they don't do 100 um, relatively soon, then I think they might end up ha being forced to do even more at the next meeting. But, you know, the, as, yeah. as, as I know, and you've presided over through your own experience, once these things start to develop a bit of market momentum, the policymakers lose control of what it is they have to do compared with what they want to do. Uh, and so it's a very fragile situation, and it would help if the if the Chancellor and the Prime Minister actually came out and gave a coherent framework of what on earth it is they're trying to do. Because this whole idea of trying to raise potential growth from two to two and a half by simply announcing a couple of tax reversals is one of the daftest things I've ever heard in my life. Jim, and I know them both, and I wish them both well. Yeah, let's get back to that. We're getting some breaking news. Nord Stream says that there's a damage to the Russian gas pipeline, which is unprecedented. I don't know whether that's having an impact actually on uh, some of the futures in gas. Certainly it will have an impact on gas flow to Europe, but I don't think it's moving uh, futures that much yet. Let's also get back, um, Hannah, into the conversation. Hannah, when you look at... You know, what, what Jim was saying, I mean, he, he's really, look, this was a, a naive budget, and to him it doesn't make sense. Does it automatically mean that, that we have sterling under such pressure that it will go below $1? I think that's that's the key concern at the moment, whether sterling will go under a dollar, whether it will go past parity. And I think that really triggers the moment at which the BOE would need to intervene. I think at the moment, if sterling is able to stay at the current levels, it's unlikely that we'll see an intervention. I think mainly because there's no guarantee that any intervention will work. And then that creates an even bigger problem because the Bank of England lose credibility. So, Jim, again, once you touch that dollar, I don't know whether that's inevitable. And once you touch that, you know, sterling or pound to one dollar, what happens afterwards? Does it just go I mean, lower? You know, obviously, there's enormous uh, image and prestige in the parity issue, but it's not really when it comes to policy the thing that should determine what the bank does. I mean, their job is to is to control inflation and inflation expectations. And if you look at what happened on Friday and yesterday together, it is pretty horrific. And, and the issue arguably this morning is more about the complete risk of a, clo of a closing down of the UK mortgage market uh, together yeah. with the pound. I mean, they're both related. So, you know, yes, obviously, uh, if the pound goes, goes below parity, it's some kind of major psychological thing for the image of UK PLC. But... It's, 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 it's equally as relevant as to how quick it drops from 108 to parity and then how quick it moves after that. I mean, you know, I'm somebody that spent over 30 years as supposedly a foreign exchange guru. The only thing I would guarantee for you is the pound is not going to stay here. I mean, it's going to be going all over the place. And, you know, I, I joked with pals of mine yesterday, <clears throat> those of us back from the, the days of the early 80s and the next decade, this used to be how it was in the norm. So the pound could go yeah. anywhere in the next two weeks. And if the bank and, and the government were serious, it might. it's very cheap. The, the pound could actually end up rebounding quite sharply. It doesn't strike me it's going to necessarily keep going down if they do the right thing. 
I mean, there are so many questions, and again, the, the famous Mark Carney words on we rely on the kindness of strangers. We I mean, do. are the markets right in, in beginning to doubt the UK's ability to repay its debt? Because that's essentially what we're looking at. <clears throat> well, you look at the whole thing. I was thinking about it last night, going back to my own basic economics training. You've got a, a recession or close to it, a current account deficit more than 8% of GDP, a central bank that's being really careful about both not obsessing the government and being worried about rising interest rates on the consumer. And now you have one of the most prolific fiscal expansions you've ever seen. And as I heard somebody else pointing out on the BBC this morning, borrowing costs that are higher than Greece and Italy. Um, you put all those four together, it's hardly uh, inspiring, is it? Okay, well, what does that mean for positioning, Hannah, in the markets right now? Is it right? I mean, there's a bit of dip buying. Will that continue? Yeah, I think so. I think what, what we're really seeing is, or what we're recommending clients do, is really to stay close to benchmark. I think uh, the unfortunate reality is everywhere is a pain trade at the moment. So if clients are looking to go overweight, cash is king. Cash is kind of where you can get a bit of yield and, and where we are seeing flows into. So that's, that's, that's kind of the consensus at the moment. But is there any part, I mean, if you look at guilt, is there any part of the UK, Hannah, that, that you know, could be longer term an opportunity given all of the uncertainty? Well, coincidentally, the UK stock market, the, the FTSE 100, tends to do, is quite dislocated from UK economics and it is concentrated with large, um, uh, large international companies which generate 80% of their revenues overseas. So a falling pound is beneficial to the FTSE 100. It's also very defensive and, and those are sectors, healthcare, consumer staples, which investors are liking at the moment as they're looking for some side, sort of respite from, from these choppy markets. So that's an interesting trade. And Jim, you mentioned, of course, mortgages, and you know, I think some of the banks are starting to pull some of the mortgages. If you see the, the I guess the, econ the UK economy, where's the, the biggest weakness that could come from this self-made possible recession or you know goal? I guess. Well, I mean, the, this mortgage thing has potential to to have its own set of issues if they're not if the policymakers aren't careful here. We we do have. Uh, you know, a market-based approach to how we provide all this stuff to consumers. And if the mortgage market shuts down, then we're going to have the, a very abrupt uh, closing of the housing market on top of everything else that uh, particularly lower-income people have to s struggle with. So, you know, somebody, I hope, is, uh, is trying to get the ear of the PM and the Chancellor to think, listen, yes, We've had a bit of fun with our intellectual uh, concepts here, but we nearly, we really need to be rethinking or following through carefully as to what it is we are really after. Even if they have all these lofty Reaganomic type aspirations, it's pretty clear the markets are saying the environment to try all of this game is just not now. Um, and I hope they're uh, giving some serious thoughts to some of the things that they said on Friday. So, uh, Jim, what, uh, an actual reversal, how would you advise, if you were in charge right now, if you were in government, what would you do practically? I mean, I think given, given the sort of intellectual zest in which they're saying what they're saying, I doubt answering that will, will, will be taken seriously. But I'd be in the camp that they should, they should rethink the immediacy of some of these fiscal uh, steps, um, the tax cuts in particular, it, you know, it's, it's quite obvious that uh, people in higher income areas that would primarily benefit from them were not mentally, you know, desperately needing these things to happen to get them more excited yeah. about whatever business it is they do. Uh, and it's it sort of politically dangerous as well in that regard because they're essentially saying we're abandoning the red wall seats uh, indirectly right. and so they, they might have problems from their own backbenchers too uh, and so I really don't get the, a lot of the kinetic logic of it both market wise and for that matter political stability wise. Jim, thank you so much. Uh, Jim O'Neill, their former Goldman Sachs Asset Management Chair and ex-government minister joining us and Hannah Smith, Vice President of State Street's ETF Business. Now, coming up on the program, we'll also talk about the global macro outlook with Christian willard Gleesman, Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy and Asset Allocation of Goldman Sachs. They just said, well, cut stocks. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Goldman is downgrading global stocks and warns a hard landing is now inevitable while flagging rising real yields as a major headwind. The bank now sees at least a 40% chance of a global recession. We're now joined by Christian Muller Gleesman, Managing Director for Portfolio Strategy and Asset Allocation at Goldman Sachs. Christian, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, there's a huge change in the markets and it's a mood that's shifting. But actually, if we had known, or I don't know whether there's something new or whether we just mispriced, you know, what kind of pain we'd see to get from the inflation we have now to where we need to be. Yeah, I think the direction of travel, I think we all knew. Um, we had very high inflation. We have central bank tightening, fighting that inflation. But I think we're getting now to levels of real yields. I think most people didn't expect we would get there. I mean, we had 150 basis points on the tips yield in the U.S. So I think that kind of shows you that the regime shift we've had on inflation is much more protracted, much deeper, and has second round effects. So you have now the UK fiscal risk premium building. I think, I think that's something a lot of people didn't have on the agenda, and it further pushes up bond yields. But, so if you look at the UK, how, how difficult is it to see you know, what's because of rising dollar, which is a, a worldwide problem for many currencies, and really a self-inflicted goal because of the mini budget, which investors are struggling to understand the reasons. I mean, they were trying to be so radical that they kind of threw everything at it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we know that year to date, the dollar um, and rising real yields in the US were the key driver and that that essentially was a big headwind for pretty much every asset for bonds for equity 60 40 portfolios had a big drawdown in the last few weeks you've got a new level here where I think the UK real yields have pushed up really sharply without any incremental central bank tightening news and and this is more related to the UK you can also see how the pound has de de declined relative to euro so I think that's a that's a rate shock which is more UK specific not related to the dollar. So, so would you actually also, if, you know, going back to the big call from Goldman on stocks, we just sell them across the board? Well, I mean, it really depends in, in what type of time horizon you're thinking. I think we, we don't think we've seen the trough in equities. Let's say 12 months. 12 months, I think it's tough because timing the bear market trough is always difficult. So if you're a 12 month investor, there is probably already value emerging. We have to be clear. We've seen a major valuation derating. We're in the later innings. I think what we always say is like the, the cycle now is reverse. Like last cycle, it was always like growth volatility driving rates volatility. And you bought the dip once you had the rates volatility. Now you have inflation volatility driving rates volatility driving growth volatility. So you, you need to wait for the growth volatility to buy the dip. And we're starting to see that. Earnings revisions in the US have turned negative. We're starting to see now the growth narrative really breaking, um, like recession probabilities are picking up within the market. So that tells us we're getting closer to those final innings. So if you're a 12-month investor, um, there will be opportunities to probably add risk in the next few months. What does that mean for the 60-40 portfolio? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, uh, we've, we've been saying that the risk of a large drawdown this year is very high because you have this combination of relatively weak and declining growth with rising inflation, strong inflation, central bank fighting, rising real yields. The good news is now valuations for both equities and for bonds have reset. So you're suddenly getting 150 basis points real yield in the U.S. You also have valuations, especially outside of the U.S., having derated a lot. So it's a better outlook for the long run for 6040. But in the near term, they're still very risky because equity drawdown risk is high yeah. and the bond market won't buffer that much. So, Chris, if you look at Treasury yields, do they automatically go to 5 percent? And again, could we have foreseen that? I think in hindsight, I think the magnitudes, as I mentioned, have been quite difficult to forecast yes. because the inflationary surprises certainly had this element of autocorrelation, this element of clustering that, that has surprised a lot of people. The, 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 the actual direction of travel we've been all uh, on, you know, focused on. But I think how much yields have moved up, especially real yields at this point, I think that was very tough to see. And I think this is what's making us so uncomfortable because 150 basis points we haven't seen for a very long time that changes the narrative from Tina, there yes. is no alternative to Tara. <laughs> um, there are reasonable alternatives. You can go to credit to get your nominal yield with relatively little risk. You can go to the tips market to get your real yield uh, with relatively little risk. So your incentive to own equities is lower. That means higher cost of capital across the board, which can drive deleveraging in the economy. Uh, what happens to dollars? So, you know, we talk about the need for a new plaza accord. I feel like I've been saying it for the last 15 years at various points that nothing ever came to fruition. But will we get some kind of coordinated central bank action, non-US? 
I don't know. I mean, right now we don't really expect that. I mean, the dollar strength is quite remarkable in terms of liquidity withdrawal, in terms of like how it also weighs on financial conditions for a lot of places in the world. And it's a huge um, kind of uh, weight on risk appetite. So my sense is the, the strong dollar we all know is starting to be a bit unhealthy. But at the same time, it also not just reflects US policy, it reflects the weakness of the rest of the world. Mm. And we would definitely hope that the latter part will get better in the coming month. And that should mean that the, the dollar kind of naturally um, weakens a bit. But in the near term, you, you, you definitely really struggle to be bearish the dollar. But is there a ceiling? I mean, I've never, you know, for, for lost, there's always a ceiling. And I feel like this time it's really hard to find. No, I agree. I think, I think you're breaking ceilings currently. You're breaking ceilings on real yields. You're breaking ceilings on the dollar, as you said. So it feels like very difficult. FX in particular, while you have fair value models, um, we know that they have the, the least predictive power um, um, in terms of compared to other valuations and other asset classes. So, so it does feel very, very difficult to, to kind of just say that's the upper bound where we will see intervention or where we will see a clear kind of uh, ceiling. I mean, if you look at Europe, so we had the ECB, of course, in the last couple of days come out with um, certain movements on QT, but they want to deal with rates first. And then you also had, you know, the elections in Italy. And the markets kind of took it in their stride. They're pretty placid. But what are the risks that you would see in Europe right now? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the next kind of uh, event we are waiting for. We now have a new Italian government, and our economists have always said that the actual result is not that uncertain. The, the polls were actually yes. quite good. Yeah. It's more kind of the policy setup coming out of that, and there's a key concern if they go above the 4%, um, um, which kind of uh, raises the concerns on debt sustainability and the policy um, backdrop in the euro area, if there's some type of, you know, um, tit for tat kind of situation um, in, in European politics. So I you're not buying BTPs? I don't know. Like, I think at this point, um, it's, it's, it's kind of to some extent priced. I think everything we're speaking about, I think we've been speaking about before the election. So there's a bit of risk premium being built in. Um, I would say, however, that, um, yeah, there's a very good chance that the volatility in the next few weeks and a bit of back and forth, um, in, you know, remains high. Yeah. China, I mean, again, we've seen actually policymakers trying to support renminbi through all of this. Yeah. Finally. Yeah, I mean, you know, as we just said, sadly, outside of the U.S., the whole rest of the world <laughs> currently <laughs> is in a difficult spot. Our expectation is that um, you do obviously have the party congress, and, and that always drives a bit of focus and potentially a bit of focus on policies going into next year. But the most important catalyst could be the COVID lockdown starting to come off next year. And I think that's still a bit further out. So in the near term, sentiment is very bearish on China. The data is very poor. So we know that as asymmetry building um, to lean against that. But it's very difficult, again, I think it feels like the same with the dollar. It feels very difficult to kind of say, now is the time to lean against that. Christian, thank you so much. As always, Christian muller Gleesman, their managing director of for Portfolio Strategy and Asset Allocation at Goldman Sachs. Now, coming up, Europe's watchdog for financial markets backs more regulation of commodity traders as the war in Ukraine continues to spark wild price swings. Our exclusive interview with the ESMA chair, Verena Ross, is next. This is Bloomberg. Parity play with the pound under siege, traders increase bets that sterling will actually fall below a dollar. While well, markets rest by Treasury yield stabilize after spiking yesterday, the yuan slides as Goldman turns more bearish on stocks. Plus, the long unwinding road, while Christine Lagarde says the ECB will only think about shrinking its balance sheet once rates are normalized. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Europe's top financial markets watchdog has suggested greater regulation for commodity trading houses in energy derivatives markets. That, along with trading halts as a fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, continues to spark wild price swings. Well, we're delighted to be joined for an exclusive conver conversation now by the ESMA chair, Verena Ross. Thank you so much for joining us. So first of all, how long would these new, new price halts actually be in place? Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, we have actually seen very significant price rises in volatile markets, as you have said, particularly in gas and electricity. And that is driven by the underlying geopolitical situation, and that is um, 
playing into the energy derivatives markets. We at ESMA, but also very importantly, the national competent authorities are focusing on monitoring the markets very closely and making sure that they function orderly because they are an important part of the pricing mechanism and price discovery. But what we've seen is in this extreme volatility period that actually very few of the existing trading holes have been triggered. And so we have suggested to introduce something that will provide measures to ensure that there's pauses in trading for market players to properly reflect of, on the information in these stressful yeah. times. And so it would be very short periods of holding the trading that will allow the pricing yeah. mechanism to restart orderly. And with that, hopefully slow down somewhat the volatility in the markets. Right. I mean, there are concerns, and we heard it from some of the banks saying that, look, they're worried that some of the circuit breakers that you would be putting in place take the market out of the marketplaces. Do you have any reassurance on that? Definitely, we are very conscious that we would need to calibrate these type of trading hold measures very carefully to ensure that the overall pricing mechanism still functions because market participants need prices to be able to manage the risk in the market. So we are proposing to do this in a very careful way and targeted way specifically at the energy markets and on a temporary basis. Yeah and only really kicking in in extreme volatility periods. But that is work we need to do to properly calibrate the trading holds. I mean, there are also, of course, concerns, and I think you mentioned this uh, in your letter, that clearing banks will be able or, you know, will not be able to accept some of the guarantees from other banks when an energy trader needs a bargain call. So what kind of leeway are you prepared to do on that? And what are the steps or how are you thinking about this going forward? So this is really about the central clearing uh, counterparty at the center of the system, which clearly needs to make sure under current legislation to be as sound as possible. And so from that perspective, CCPs can only accept highly liquid collateral with minimal credit and market risk to cover the exposures to its clearing members. These requirements are there to ensure financial stability of the CCP, but also of the system as a whole. And CCPs can accept a range of different collaterals from its clearing members. And we have had calls, particularly, as you rightly say, to widen the range of collateral to make sure that some of the non-financial companies, energy companies in particular, are able to meet margin calls maybe a bit more easily than they have in the latest period. We believe could, could we large, need to look at. Yep. No, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. We believe we need to look at this very carefully to ensure that we are not transferring risks from the energy markets into the financial markets. But one of the areas we are looking at is uncollateralized commercial bank guarantees. So what would that mean? It would basically mean that banks can extend uncollateralized guarantees and then those guarantees would be acceptable in the CCP. But we believe that should only be possible under very strict conditions on a temporary measure, making sure there's proper concentration limits and proper ability of the CCP to realize these guarantees if it comes to that. So this needs to be, again, very carefully calibrated to ensure that we are not creating risks for financial stability. So could you also, though, loosen some of the large exposure limits? So the banking regulation obviously has its own prudential measures to ensure that banks properly manage their risks, including large exposures. And that would be something that we need to cooperate on very closely with the banking regulators and supervisors as well to ensure that in creating potentially more flexibility in the collateral that would be acceptable, we are not creating a risks either for the banks or for the CCP in question. Um, could you just maybe, if we take a step back, overall what you're saying is some of the biggest commodity trading companies you know, should really be under the same scrutiny as investment firms. Is this because their role has changed or how do you see their weighting in current markets? So this is something which we don't believe is an immediate measure that needs to be taken, but something to be more considered in the medium term, where non-financial companies that uh, currently trade and provide services on commodity derivatives markets 
are not authorized as investment firms. They are exempted from the current requirements. And in some way, that is reasonable because it is an auxiliary activity to their main function as an energy company. But the question is, these companies, and particularly some of the big ones, are not just purely hedging their business requirements. No. They're clearly becoming an ever bigger player in these markets. And if that is the case, is there a rationale to think about should they, based on the nature of their business, also start mm -hmm. being regulated as financial companies would be, as investment firms would be? But very not. I mean, there were a lot of concerns, certainly in February, March, that we'd have a, a huge margin call that actually uh, some of the commodity traders wouldn't be able to match. Are those concerns now, you know, put to one side? Does it give us, you know, an idea of strength, or could it still happen if the situation with Russia gets much worse? Obviously, the underlying question is what will happen in the energy markets, depending on further um, actions by Russia or in the um, and gas and electricity markets. The um, question of liquidity for the non-financial companies that are part in this market remains. Some countries have extended specific guarantee schemes or uh, backing from the government, but it is clear that some of these companies still find it difficult to find the liquidity to meet margin calls if we see significant increase in volatility. And that's why we're looking at the two measures that I talked about. On the one hand, right. trading holds or um, some uh, measures to smoothen volatility, and the other one on whether we can extend collateral beyond what is currently right. doable. Verena Ross, thank you so much for joining us, the chair there of the European Securities and Markets Authority with a very important conversation. Now, let's also get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Christine Lagarde said the ECB will consider shrinking its balance sheet only once it has completed the normalization of interest rates. The central bank president told lawmakers in Brussels that for now, raising borrowing costs is the most appropriate and effective tool to combat record inflation. Deal terms seen by Bloomberg show, show Volkswagen is likely to price the Porsche IPO at the top end of an initial range. It is a sign of how much demand there is for the share sale. At the top end, the sports car maker would be valued at almost $73 billion. VW is expected to set the IPO price tomorrow with Porsche shares to begin trading on Thursday. Negotiations between the Biden administration and TikTok over an agreement that that would let the app keep operating in the U.S. are said to have stalled. Sources say the sticking point is concerned that Chinese ownership poses a national security threat. We are told an agreement would allow the platform to continue operating in the U.S. with additional restrictions on how much data from American users is stored. BMW expects global deliveries of its fully electric vehicles to jump more than 70 percent next year. The 400,000 as demand remains strong. CFO Nicholas Peter says the company aims to make another big leap in sales of purely electric vehicles in 2023. He also says worldwide sales this year will be slightly lower than last due to losses in the first half. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now coming up, the BOE quashes speculation about an emergency move as traders bet sterling will reach parity with the dollar. Well, David Folkert's Landau, chief economist at Deutsche Bank joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's turn back to the UK. The Bank of England and the Treasury are trying to calm financial markets. The pound rebounding slightly this morning. Speculators still increasing bets that sterling will slide below $1. Well, joining us now is David Folkert's Landau, Chief Economist at Deutsche Bank. David, you've been way out front on actually what you think pound will do and, and where the Bank of England has gotten wrong. What's the prescription for them today? Well, the Bank of England has been late in raising rates and uh, in too small amounts. So if one is to point one's finger 
at an institution that uh, perhaps could have performed better is the Bank of England. Th this is ultimately a funding crisis and it's kicked off by a, uh, a fiscal, uh, uh, an abrupt fiscal program, necessary, but somewhat abrupt and real rates are negative yet the yeah. goods have to be sold abroad and investors want real rates to be positive so you, you have it. So uh, how far behind do you think the Bank of England is? Where should we, we be right now in terms of interest rates? Oh, probably as much as between two and three hundred basis points. I think we should, re okay. this, this, and we will get there. Can uh, we make up for lost time? Uh, probably not, but to wait till November 3rd would be a little risky. Uh, I wouldn't do anything right now because it just creates a sensation of, of crisis and, and I think that's not a good idea. But uh, uh, we would have to think in terms of uh, uh, base rates being like between 7 and 8 percent, 7 and a half percent thereabouts to stabilize the uh, ability to sell debt. But so, David, you think this was basically you know, a mistake from the Chancellor and a mistake from the Bank of England almost right from the very start? And a mistake is a, hard, is a hard word. This is a question of judgment. I believe that a course correction in the government was necessary. I think that uh, Johnson didn't have conviction. This is a government with convictions, and I, I applaud that. I think that's tremendous. I think the basic measures are, uh, are correct. Uh, I think tax, dedu tax deductions is, reduction is, a, is the right way to go, uh, as is deregulation. The um, question is whether it was the right time, and the question is whether the Bank of England was ready for it. So. Uh, that those are the issues. But ultimately, no way around it. Debt needs to be sold at uh, positive real rates, and to get there, you have to raise rates. So uh, how will we work through this? Does it touch, does it sterling touch one dollar and below before we see adjustment from the Bank of England? No, I don't believe so. I think that the, uh, sterling will be at 115 before it will be at uh, uh, go below parity. <clears throat> And this is what we've seen so far has been an aberration, uh, um, justifiably. But when you think in terms of, of uh, CDS spreads for gilts being uh, higher than any other country in the Eurozone except for Italy and Spain, uh, and this is a country that hasn't defaulted on its debt since Edward I in uh, 1200, so almost 1,000 years ago, that's just completely wrong. So uh, from that point of view, I think this, this will work out okay for sterling over the medium term. Do you think the, the you know, Bank of England governor has to go? No, I do not. I do not. I think this, 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 Bailey is, a, is, is very good at the helm. He's a good man. Uh, and not at all. Uh, this is a judgment call. And the market reacted quicker than, and faster than uh, most of us had expected. Yeah. And now we have to sort, that, sort our way through that. But I think it has to be done with confidence and uh, not with haste. And as said, rates have to go up significantly. So, so, so where are we, you know, where do you expect rates to be, real rates to be at the end of the year? Uh, real rates need to be above one, one and a half percent uh, in line with the U.S. You cannot, you cannot be significantly below that. It might even be as high as two percent. Uh, and it's going to be costly. Uh, uh, higher real interest rates is going to hurt uh, homeowners, uh, mortgage holders. And uh, so it'll be, it'll be a costly venture. That together with, with uh, significantly higher energy prices, we, we're thinking in terms of a recession that uh, will be deep and long. Uh, it's the price we have to pay for financial stability and yeah. for getting on the right track. H how deep and, and how long? I would say, I would think it for three to four quarters and a uh, percent and a half, two percent down significantly. Are, are there, I mean, what are the unintended consequences of actually raising rates, I guess so quickly, if what you're saying is true, we do it by the end of the year? Well, in, in the UK, uh, rate increases feed very quickly into the housing sector because mortgages are tied to the base rate. And uh, so that's going to be very painful. Uh, and there may have to be some um, social help, some payments to offset that for the uh, uh, less uh, advantaged uh, homeowners. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's feasible and doable. It won't cost all that much. Do, but do you see a, a collapse almost of the housing market in, in the UK in this, in this kind of scenario? No, I don't think so. I, uh, a collapse, collapse, I think, in terms of you know, 30, 40, 50 percent down in house prices, uh, and I don't think we're going to get there at all. Uh, so no. Uh, but I think unemployment will go up significantly, and it will be a painful recession. It will, it's, it's a painful thing. Uh, but I do not believe that there is a way around this. And the longer we deny that, the longer, the, the, more, the, more, the longer it's going to be. I, I was going to ask you what happens if actually the Bank of England doesn't follow through with the, with the hikes that you think are needed by December. 
Well, there are these two views. One of them is that you can kind of do it slowly and sort of see what happens and, and, and tap your way through it. Uh, and I believe that's a very costly way. It just extends it and uh, it doesn't create the credibility you need for bondholders to, uh, uh, to uh, come along with you. The other way is to do it quickly, upfront, uh, take the pain and get on with it. And I believe from that point of view, hopefully then the measures, the fiscal measures will kick in and the deregulatory measures will kick in as well. I mean, ultimately, it's, it's an old story that if you want to do fiscal restructuring or fiscal reform, you need to have a certain amount of funding, a certain amount of financing to finance that. And there, uh, as I said, that has to come in because US is, the UK is running a large current account deficit. So foreigners have to be willing to hold your debt. David, thank you so much. As always, David Forkert, Landau, the chief economist at <coughs> Deutsche Bank, very clear in his thoughts and always punchy. Coming up, first monetary policy normalization, then we talk QT at the ECB. That's what Christine Lagarde had to say <coughs> yesterday. We'll have plenty more on that with David Forkert, Landau. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Christine Lagarde says the European Central Bank will consider shrinking its balance sheet only once it has completed the normalization of interest rates. While still with us, David Folkerts Landau, he's chief economist at Deutsche Bank. David, thank you so much for staying with me. So we talked a lot about the UK. If you look at the ECB, I mean, the situation it seems to be more stable, but actually because of the proximity with Russia and also this latest headline on Nord Stream 2, how, how worried are you about Germany? Uh, we're quite concerned about Germany. We believe that all the numbers that we see and the, <clears throat> the, the corporate contacts that we have, that uh, Germany will not escape a serious recession that's going to last for a while. So we think in terms of anywhere between 3 and 5% uh, uh, negative growth for three quarters, two to three quarters. So very serious, even by the, the big recession standards of 2008 <clears throat> and uh, with, with unemployment rates going up. So it's, it's a very serious problem. What's your prescription for, we, for Germany then? We would expect there will be gas rationing. In other words, the, the, the emergency level three will be reached. Uh, and uh, that'll be diff <coughs> that's going to have a significant impact on the, on the corporate, sec corporate sector. Uh, so in terms of prescription, I think ultimately one has to uh, uh, raise the price of energy so that people consume less. Uh, the corporate sector has been very, very good in cutting their consumption already by as much as 20%. Household sector less so, in part because prices haven't really risen as much as they should, and uh, you need a lot of uh, uh, of savings of energy yeah. consumption there. <clears throat> it's going to persist for a while because the ability to bring uh, uh, natural gas uh, on stream and LNG yeah. on stream is uh, is slow, yeah. not just of infrastructure, but also you're competing in the global market with Asian consumers and prices going up. Yeah. Ultimately, when you put this in context. We've taken about, no, the energy crisis takes about a trillion dollars out of the European economy as a whole. So, I mean, I think of it as a trillion dollar tax being imposed that you have to deal with. So you cannot hope this is going to go unnoticed. But for example, so, <coughs> so Euro level doesn't help at all with exports because this is also supply chain issues w within the world exacerbated in Europe, right? No, I think the worst part of the Euro level is that it contributes to inflation significantly, yes. which is something they definitely cannot use right now. Or, uh, so, uh, and, and it's not presumed to be long enough term to change export pricing very much. I mean, it will do a little bit, but, but not profoundly, unless there's an expectation that it'll stay there, which it won't. As we're getting <coughs> into the winter months, when we're going to see this rationing and also maybe people not, not having enough gas, and we're talking about possible you know, black, blackouts being engineered by the energy companies, what does that mean for next year and, and the year after? I don't know whether we, you worry about politically a kind of schism in the way people vote or whether it's no, just not, economic. No, not, not, not in Germany. I think the German political uh, arrangements are quite stable are, uh, <coughs> and quite competent, I might add. I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of what they have been doing. I think the government has been extremely competent in averting what could have been serious financial crisis <clears throat> with, the, with the collateral issues, uh, as you know. Yeah. And they've been very, very good at that. So I don't, it's not a political issue, it's more an economic issue. And this is going to be with us for a while, not just this year, but also going into next winter. There'll be more coming on stream, but it will be slow. What's your prescription or what's your thinking on banks right now? So there's, again, talks that actually central banks or certainly the BOE and the ECB will look at some of the windfall taxes. Well, there are two issues to this. Uh, of course, uh, 
when, when, our, when, when the university of our clients does badly, banks will do badly. You can't help that now because we, we're the provider of credit to them. And uh, <clears throat> I would expect that some of that will happen uh, to which, as, as next year comes, but not to the point of where it, I think, where it would pose any difficulties for the banking system at all. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of excess profits collection, I think that's more an issue for the energy companies and less for the banks. So. David, thank you so much, as always, for joining me. David Forkutz, Landauer, Chief Economist at Deutsche Bank. More Bloomberg surveillance next. This is Bloomberg. I do think we're, you know, we're not a million miles from the bottom, but we will get a lot of volatility. I find it hard to label this a panic. The moves are extreme, but they are explainable. Right now is be defensive and look for the opportunity to add back to risk. We're very underweight equities. When the equities we do have, we're emphasizing earnings consistency, margin consistency, cons uh, profitability. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Turning bearish on stocks, Goldman Sachs and BlackRock are urging investors to stay away from equities in the short term because the risks of recession have not, they say, been priced in. Traders boost their bets that the pound will drop below a dollar. Meanwhile, London's top bankers will have some tough questions when they meet with the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng later today. And it's the clearest signal yet that gas will not flow to Germany this winter through one of the Nord Stream pipelines. The pipeline's operator says that it has sustained unprecedented damage. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And is that it, Kayleigh? Is that the end of the selling or is this just a pause in the selling of risk assets we've seen of late? Well, that's an excellent question, Anna. I'm not sure that any of us really know the answer to it. Time will tell. But I will say you definitely didn't see that big selling pressure present in Asia overnight, where it was a modest update for equities overall. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index rising by just about a third of 1%. But of course, a lot of the action hasn't just been concentrated in risk assets, but in the bond and foreign exchange mar market. In the bond market, of course, we saw massive, massive moves in gilts yesterday. Same with U.S. Treasuries. And you saw some follow through to that in the Asian session. In New Zealand, for example, the 10-year yield rising about 10 basis points to 4.285%. And that pressure, putting upward pressure on yields in Japan as well. The 20-year JGB yield is now at its highest since 2015, rising three basis points on the day to 1.037%. That is why the Bank of Japan conducted an unannounced or an unplanned bond buying program. They are trying to maintain that yield curve control and, of course, that 25 basis point cap on the 10-year JGB yield. All that said, even though Japan is still stimulating and keeping policy easy. You do actually see a stronger Japanese yen on the day, but a lot is stronger against the U.S. dollar today. Right now, dollar yen trading at 144.36, Matt. Yeah, the dollar down in general, and that's really giving a lift to the risk rally that we're seeing here. Futures up more than 1% on the S&P after the big drops that we've seen over the past, uh, really the 10-day drop that we've seen. Um, U.S. 10-year yield coming down again after it went over 390 right now at 382 383 um, and the Bloomberg US dollar index is at 1348 right now. These are still incredibly high levels um, compared to what we've seen in recent history, but the drops that we've seen overnight are what's leading to the boost in futures, the boost in other risk assets like crude. You can see NYMEX for example at 7790 a barrel, so still under 80 but at least coming up 1.5%. I didn't include Bitcoin on here. Anna, but it is also up like 5% over 20,000. So mm. basically risk assets ready to rally today in a, what may be seen as kind of a dead cat bounce. Right, and we'll certainly have some analysis of what Bitcoin and crypto are doing a little bit later on in the show, weren't we? Yeah, this turnaround Tuesday, it started out well in Europe. We had all sectors in positive territory earlier on in the uh, trading day in a sort of relief move after Monday's sell-off. Uh, but that hasn't lasted. We've now got three sectors in negative territory, real estate, utilities, um, and the banking sector, all of those moving lower. Some of those weighing, in particular real estate, weighing on the UK market right now. So the FTSE down two-tenths of a percent, the CAC and the DAX both making modest gains up between two and four-tenths of a percent. We've 
about some interesting news surrounding gas flows into Europe or the potential for the restoration of gas uh, flows and that's having an impact on European assets. So the euro pairing some of its earlier gain it was managing to make some gains against a weaker US dollar which did seem to be one of the key factors in driving this move into risk assets in the past 24 hours. So the euro had made some gains but then giving up those gains as we got news that Nord Stream had suffered from unprecedented damage the source of which is not entirely clear. We'll get some further analysis in just a moment but that has pulled down the euro and natural gas prices in Europe jumped by 7.6% as we're focused on what exactly has caused gas, le gas leaks and a drop in pressure to be identified on, on, Nord, Stream, uh, on Nord Stream pipelines. And now both of them, of course, out of action. The pound is up by 1.1%. It's at 108. That is a very different handle to 103. We touched in the Asia trading session early on Monday. Uh, so we have reclaimed some of the ground. The Bank of England and the Treasury both putting out statements after hours yesterday trying to soothe the markets. Has it worked in the short term? Will it work uh, across the month of October, which is uh, perhaps uh, more in focus. This is the UK five-year yield. And again, a turnaround from yesterday's moves. Yesterday was all about selling gilts and higher interest rates, higher gilt yields across the curve in the UK. Today, we're seeing a bit of a pairing of those moves of yesterday, a little bit of short-term relief, at least, for UK assets, Matt. All right, so uh, definitely keeping our eye on that ball. Let's get more now on the damage that Nord Stream uh, to the Nord Stream pipeline that we just learned about in the last hour. Vanessa Dizem, our energy and climate reporter, joins us from Frankfurt. So, Vanessa, what do we know um, and what don't we know about the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 damage? Yeah, so we know that things happened uh, almost simultaneously. So we saw uh, pressure dropping in both uh, Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2 pipelines. And Nord Stream operators said that actually there is no clue. They cannot say, it's impossible to say uh, uh, when flows can resume through the pipeline. We see uh, there are some gas uh, leaks. Uh, they were detected uh, in the Danish and Swedish uh, exclusive economic zones. Uh, Germany said it's investigating. Denmark said it is stepping up um, security at its energy facilities. Uh, we don't know the reasons. We don't know what is the actual impact of those leaks. So uh, there is still a lot uh, being investigated. Yeah, a lot to discover, a lot to, to understand about what has called the, caused this then, Vanessa. What does this mean for energy markets? I just uh, highlighted a jump in uh, the benchmark energy price in Europe today. Uh, but that, is that because it's telling us something about the future and the chances of seeing supply restored? Because both of these pipelines are idled at the moment. Exactly. So both, let's remember, uh, both pipelines are idle. Nord Stream uh, was halted. The flows through Nord Stream were halted um, uh, earlier this month. And also Nord Stream 2 has never sent any gas to Europe after uh, Russia started its war in Ukraine. And so actually uh, there is no impact in gas supplies to Europe. There is no impact. But look, the markets, traders uh, are already tense. The situation is tense. Markets are really tight. And that just adds to this uh, uh, situation, to this bullish moment. And now that we know that it's impossible uh, to say when Nord Stream flows will resume, that is uh, something that adds to this nervous moment. Absolutely. All right, Vanessa Desm reporting from Frankfurt. Thank you so much. Let's turn now to stocks because Goldman Sachs and BlackRock are both turning more bearish on equities, warnings that, warning that markets are yet to price in the risk of a global recession. Bloomberg's Danny Berger is joining us now for more. So, Danny, no one could accuse the bears of hibernation. <laughs> that is certainly true. And, and look, it, it feels like it used to just be Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, but you're having some of the big um, banking strategists join him and saying things could get worse from here. So yeah, you mentioned it's BlackRock saying shun stocks. It's Goldman Sachs downgrading their three-month outlook. It comes at a time where the entirety of this market is really jittery against risk assets, really everything. I mean, bonds are selling off as well. Everything's safe for the dollar. So S&P falling to a new low for the year yesterday. So what does it mean for things to to get worse. What are they pointing to? You have Goldman Sachs, for example, saying that Tina is over. It's instead replaced by Tara. There is an alternative for Tia, rather. I need to get my acronym straight. He points to the fact, Christian muller glissman that we have yields rising. Real yields are going higher. This is bad for risk assets, but also it means that you can get yields
yields elsewhere. For our radio listening audience, I have a chart of the equity risk premium. So forward earnings yield versus 10-year yield on the S&P versus Treasuries. And we're getting closer to one to one. It doesn't look this Fed model isn't necessarily ringing out that stock valuations look good at this point. And I should say it's not just yields. It's not just bonds. It's also cash, really short maturity instruments and cash-like instruments finally are yielding something. It's 2% and more in a lot of cases. And look, that's not a ton, but if you're really worried about this market, park it out in cash. At least that's what lots of folks have been doing. We're seeing money market funds nearing $5 trillion in assets. All right, Danny, thanks very much. Danny Berger laying out the bear cases there. Now let's get to the central bank issue. Christine Lagarde says the ECB will only consider shrinking its balance sheet once it has normalized rates. So QT after rate hikes. Lagarde told lawmakers in Brussels yesterday that interest rates remain the appropriate policy tool to fight inflation. When we have completed our monetary policy normalization using the most appropriate, efficient and effective tool that are the interest rates, then we will ask ourselves how, when, at which rhythm, at which pace uh, we use uh, the other monetary tools that we have available, including quantitative tightening uh, as a result. Jamie Rush, Bloomberg Economics Chief European Economist, joins us now. So, Jamie, we know, I guess, the sequencing. Do we know how high um, they're expected to go? On, on rates, I mean, I, I think they're, they're going to continue with another 75 basis point hike uh, in the, the next meeting. And we'll probably feel they're able to slow down a little bit thereafter. Um, really, you should. I think we should be viewing the current moves that ECB is conducting as as a catch-up process to, to where they want to be. It's not, it's not that we're, the, the terminal rate is going to be materially higher than people expected. But I, and I think the decision on delaying quantitative tightening, or at least that decision until later, is an extremely sensible one. Uh, right now, Italian yields are about 4.6% for the 10-year. Uh, we're already in a position where Italian debt is looking extremely dangerous. Uh, so there is, there is no urgency to, um, to, to, to start adding an additional fuel to that fire. OK, so that's the ECB story right now, Jamie. Let's pivot to the UK, which I know you track, of course, as well. Uh, the Bank of England and the Treasury both uh, putting out statements after hours yesterday, trying to calm the markets. And at least if you look at what's happened in the pound since then, you know, maybe there's been some success to that. But is that just short-lived, driven by a little bit of uh, relief selling in the dollar? Um, well, I mean, I think things aren't getting worse. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's the good thing. Um, but we are a long way from where we were even last week. The, you know, the pound is down hugely. Gilt yields are up by, you know, approaching three percentage points compared with, uh, with August at the five-year horizon. But we are about to see a very, very sharp tightening of financial conditions. And, we, and we're seeing it already. And, you know, mortgage rates are going up. Uh, some people are finding it difficult to access that finance. Um, the, you know, the, actually, the government and the bank don't really have time to wait until the end of November to set out their strategy because the effects are being felt on the ground right now. Yep, and the pressure is growing on these monetary policymakers. Jamie Rush of Bloomberg Economics, thank you so much. Let's get back to the equity markets now and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Matt briefly mentioned how we are seeing Bitcoin rallying today. It's up more than 5% back north of $20,000, and that is giving a lift to crypto-related equities in pre-market trading. The likes of Coinbase, the big crypto exchange, higher by about 4.4%. Among other groups of stocks getting a lift this morning include those tied to some of those commodity plays that are rebounding today. The energy select sector spider ETF, which gauges how the sector as a whole will be doing come the opening bell, is up about one and a quarter percent in pre-market trading. And you're seeing a nice rebound as well for some of those large cap, high multiple big tech players too, the likes of Apple and Tesla, each up about one to one and a half percent before the bell, Anna. Coming up, we'll talk about where we head next for risk assets and what the underlying inflation picture looks like. Todd uh, Jablonski joins us, Principal Global Investors, Chief Investment Officer. He says we're in for a long ride still. Inflation sits higher for longer. We'll get into that conversation. We'll also talk to Jeff Kendrick, Standard Chartered Head of Crypto and EMFX. Uh, also, on the subject of crypto, tune in to Bloomberg Crypto today and every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time with Kaylee and Matt. This week, they'll be speaking to the billionaire Sam Bankman Free. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Now, Bloomberg chart boss and Olympic level rower Dan Curtis put together a chart for me that goes all the way back to 2011 and shows 10 day drops that have been nearly as serious as the one we just witnessed. Now, there actually in the last decade have only been about five drops that match what we've seen. Maybe we could see a big bounce back as oftentimes they are followed by other bounces. Ksenia Galuchko, Bloomberg Ed Equities Editor, joins us now to talk about what to expect after this big drop. Ksenia? Yes, Matt. I mean, it's been a, a, a really dramatic drop. We've seen a decline of over 10% for the S&P 500 over the past 10 days. And like you correctly said, in the past, when we did see this magnitude of declines, it was followed by a big bounce for the S&P 500. So, for example, remember February, March 2020, during the pandemic lows and the fears of lockdowns, that was followed by one of the biggest rallies in the S&P 500. And this could happen once more this time around, just because we're so oversold at the moment. And Kazenia, when you think about the UK story, uh, the, the focus has been on the pound, it's been on gilt markets, rightly, because that's where we've seen so much reaction. It's more complicated in the FTSE 100, and actually some of the companies gaining from the weakness in the currency. Maybe the 250, the, the, the smaller caps, tell a, a cleaner picture of the UK. Absolutely. So FTSE 100 is actually winning from the weakness in the pound. And since uh, Truss's uh, election, uh, the, uh, the FTSE 100 has been outperforming just because it has so many exporter companies like oil and mining giants that are actually outperforming with the pound's weakness. For the FTSE 250, the news is not great, and it's been erasing billions in market cap because of the pressure on the pound, because of inflation, because of concerns about recession, and because of the BOE rate hikes that might drive the economy into a contraction. And while we're talking about rate hikes, let's talk about what we're seeing in the bond market and how that influences the equity market. Ksenia, can things really get better for equities if the 10-year real inflation-adjusted yield is 1.5% here in the U.S.? That's why the environment is so challenging for equities right now. Goldman Sachs says in a note today that while over the past 10 years, Tina mentality, there is no alternative to equities, was the dominant one in the market. That is now no longer true. And bonds are starting to look very attractive with these yields so high. So that's why the competition for equities is increasing. The environment is not as smooth for stocks anymore. Bonds are starting to look much more appealing these days. Okay, yes, as Danny was telling us earlier, from Tina to Tara, there are reasonable alternatives according to that research. Kazenia, thank you very much. Kazenia Galuchko uh, joining us there with a look at stocks. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. That's where you find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Hurricane Ian is threatening to become the worst storm to hit Tampa in more than a century. Ian has picked up strength and now has winds of 110 miles per hour. It has made landfall over western Cuba. A hurricane watch and storm surge warning is in effect along Florida's west coast, which includes Tampa. More than 300,000 people are expected to evacuate. President Biden is repeating his demands for oil companies to charge less. At a meeting of the White House Competition Council, the president said that the price of oil worldwide was down last month, but, quote, we haven't seen the lower prices reflected at the pump. Gasoline prices in the U.S. have fallen by more than a dollar since hitting a peak of more than $5 a gallon in June. Senate Democrats, meanwhile, have proposed a short-term funding bill aimed at averting a government shutdown. Congress must pass the measure by midnight on Friday. But the package includes a measure to speed up energy permits that's opposed by most Republicans and some Democrats. Leaders of both parties are anxious to avoid a shutdown a little more than a month before midterm elections. And a meeting today between Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng, and top British financiers could be difficult. Since he introduced his mini-budget on Friday, the pound has plunged and shares in British banks and insurers have been battered. Those attending the meeting will want answers on how Kwarteng can restore investor confidence. And of course, that is something we continue to follow in the markets today. Matt, yes, you are seeing a rebound in the British pound, the cable rate back up to 107.92. The question is, how stable is it really if you have this kind of fiscal policy and a Bank of England that may not make any kind of move until November. Is
parity, something that could be coming in the near term. Right. And what kind of financing costs are British businesses and, um, you know, British homeowners facing? And I've already heard reports of Virgin Money, I think it's canceled its mm. mortgage offers and a number of others, as um, many Americans don't know. UK, in the UK, you've got to refinance your mortgage oftentimes after seven or 10 years, and that's going to be very difficult if interest yeah. rates shoot up the most on record. Yeah, usually less than 10. I think uh, usually these uh, these rates are fixed for two, three, five years. And, uh, and and so for a lot of people, a refinancing of that debt at higher interest rates looms. So this meeting is going to be really interesting because there'll be some in the financial universe, in the city where I'm sitting, who very much welcomed the lifting of the cap on bonuses, some of the deregulation that's being talked about by this government. But on the other hand, very concerned, as you say, Matt, about the higher refinancing costs. But but Matt, I was pleased to read, and this I was reminded by by reading uh, some, some, uh, some pieces written by our colleagues, colleagues at Bloomberg News, that Kwasi Kwarteng actually did a PhD on the 17th century sterling crisis. So, you know, maybe within that, some lessons have been learned. I, I was actually reading yesterday that the UK actually got an IMF bailout in 1976, oh, yes. a $3.9 billion loan because of a, a previous conservative plan to boost growth via spending. So it yes. seems history, if been, it doesn't yes. repeat itself, at least it rhymes, right? I was alive, not quite old enough to remember it, but yes, the 1976, the time that uh, a time that the uh, the IMF stalked the corridors of power here in the UK, not something that uh, uh, most people in Westminster want to see repeated. Uh, but yes, there's been a lot of talk about the 1970s, what we should be learning about attempts to boost growth, how similar or otherwise is this experience now. We'll talk about the broader markets and risk appetite with Todd Jablonski, who joins us shortly from Principal Global Investors. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Turning bearish on stocks, Goldman Sachs and BlackRock are urging investors to stay away from equities in the short term because the risks of recession have not been priced in. Traders boost their bets that the pound will drop below a dollar. Meanwhile, London's top bankers will have some tough questions when they meet with Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng later today. And it's the clearest signal yet that gas won't flow to Germany this winter through Nord Stream. The pipeline's operator says that it has sustained unprecedented damage. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And a bit of a turnaround Tuesday in terms of sentiment, it seems, underway, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't want to be Kwasi Kwarteng today or need gas in Europe. Nonetheless, it looks like we have a risk rally underway. At least here in the U.S., we do see futures gaining uh, right now about three quarters of one percent. They have been higher earlier in the session. So maybe as we get closer and closer to the opening bell in four hours, four hours, <laughs> then uh, we'll see that dissipate a little bit. Nonetheless, we see um, the 10 year yield coming down. It had been deeper before, but we were up to over 390 yesterday. So um, still a high level, but letting off some pressure. The Bloomberg dollar index also letting out a little bit of pressure coming off a little bit from the all time high that we saw yesterday and NYMEX crude gaining along with other risk assets, including Bitcoin, which we're going to talk about later on in the program right now. Uh, New York crude uh, WT trading at 77.35 a barrel. Kaylee? Well, Matt, we're going to talk about Bitcoin later on, but I'm also going to talk about it right now because with a move upward of about 5% back north of $20,000, that's giving a lift to crypto-related equities in pre-market trading. The likes of Marathon Digital, Riot Blockchain, each up in the ballpark of 5 to 6%. You're seeing a lift for stocks in other areas of the market as well. Matt, you were talking about how we are seeing a bit of a lift in oil and other commodity prices today, and that is having a subsequent effect on some of those materials and commodities related stocks in early hours. Cleveland Cliffs is up about one percentage points and Halliburton up by about eight tenths of one percent before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, here in Europe then, we've got a fairly static picture for stocks, but it's a better risk appetite than we saw yesterday, it would seem, and certainly on Friday. So after a couple of days of negativity for risk assets and certainly negativity around the pound and around gilts, uh, this is what we have for European stocks this morning, up by two-tenths of one percent. We did have all sectors in positive territory. Now those uh, gains pairing back a little bit and the picture looks a little bit more mixed. One of the things that has made the picture a little bit more mixed is what's been developing around Nord Stream. Uh, the natural gas price has jumped once again here in Europe, up by just shy 
high of 10%. We've got these reports around an hour ago that suggested there'd been uh, some gas leaks detected around Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. These pipelines not in operation right now, but this, uh, the, 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 the fact that this damage was described by the Nord Stream operator as unprecedented, uh, that's certainly something that the market is watching very closely. Now, the Kremlin has said just in the last few minutes they're extremely concerned by the Nord Stream damage reports, uh, but they also say it's premature to speculate on the cause of this Nord Stream damage. As I say, these pipelines not in use at the moment, but they raise questions about how quickly supplies of gas could, uh, should they want to be restored to Europe. Uh, this is what we see on the pound right now, 107.83, so back up from 103, which is where we dropped to during the Asia session yesterday. So some of the words that we're hearing from maybe the Treasury, the Bank of England, perhaps comforting in the short term. We've certainly seen a turnaround for some reason. And the two-year yield, uh, just after we saw those big moves higher in yields across the curve in the UK yesterday, today looks different. We're seeing those yields coming down. The yield dropping on the two-year, 32 basis points. Uh, in fact, it's just 28 basis points right now, setting the biggest drop, though, earlier since 2008. So, Matt, uh, the yields went up yesterday and seem to be coming down today. There's a lot of volatility in UK do you, assets. Right do now. you remember the James Bond living daylights? It was not one with Sean Connery or Daniel Craig. I'm, I'm sure I do, but don't test me on the detail. I just, it's, I'm reminded of it today because he flies down, I think, in some part of that movie, a gas pipeline. And now there are questions <laughs> of why there would be pressure problems at three different points along the pipeline. And I know Danish authorities um, are looking into it with security officials. So it could be that there is some sort of sabotage. I guess that's one of the many possibilities here. So I find it so interesting. And then I think back to Timothy Dalton is the one who played uh, in, uh, in that movie, Living Daylights. Joining us now is not Timothy Dalton, but Todd Jablonski. We're much happier to have you, Todd, Principal Global Investor, Chief Investment Officer. Um, what do you make of the big drops that we've seen? I mean, I have heard for, I think, like 10 days in a row that the Fed is doubling down on its rate rises. Um, do we know yet? Have we priced that in yet? Or are we still coping with it? Well, that's really the multi-million dollar question, isn't it? Has the market fully digested and processed all of the tightening that's going to have to happen, not just at the Fed, but from global central banks to really arrest what has been runaway inflation? I mean, I go back to the beginning of the year, and we take a look and you realize that the expectations for Fed funds rates at the beginning of this year were 350 basis points below where we are today. That's an extremely large forecasting miss. And that's going to require a lot of digestion, I think, from investors to really process. Our view at Principal Global Investors today is to be underweight equities because we, we think that risk assets have really yet to price in the risk of recession in 2023. OK, Todd, good morning to you. I mean, if these inflation rates would just come down, life would be a lot simpler in many parts of the world, wouldn't it? But you think that they will stay persistent at these higher levels for longer. What do we need to brace ourselves for? Well, I think Jerome Powell and other central bankers would be quite pleased if it were easy to navigate sort of an arresting of excess demand. But that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to diminish that excess demand in a way that will take inflation perhaps down to about, in the U.S., 7% at year-end. And some of our forecasts do suggest you could see additional declines down to the low single digits by year-end 2023. I think investors should brace themselves for continued separation between what expectations are and what Fed actions might be. And when you see those, uh, those misses between expectations and reality, that's when investors are surprised. That's when markets head lower. We, we all know why yields are heading higher globally, almost globally, it seems. And that is to do with higher expectations around central bank policy globally. But at the same time, at some point, those, those yields start to attract investors, don't they? And I spoke to one investor earlier who was saying, you know, this is getting to the point. This is starting to look quite attractive, the bond market. Where are you in that thought process? I've been impressed with the statements I've heard of late around the high levels of yield today. That's all relative to where we were a couple of years ago. Go back 10 years, 20 years, they still look relatively low. In the post-GFC world. In the post-GFC yeah. world. What I would say there to that effect is that I think it's a bit early to look at fixed income and see a source of safety. Yes, the rate risk has diminished as we've seen rates already move higher, but the spread risk has remained relatively tame even as earnings expectations have now diminished globally to just a 3% gain for the year. We're a bit concerned that you could see spread widening that in fact impacts the stability of core fixed income. We like lower volatility alternative asset classes in today's in market environment. 
Todd, you talk about earnings expectations and the risks there. How large of a factor is the dollar in that? They certainly play, the dollar plays a role in it as the repatriation of earnings back to the U.S., particularly by mega cap multinationals, is dented by the stronger dollar. You do see that start to show up. At the same time, I don't know that the dollar is really the headline there. I think it's a true organic fundamental slowing of economic activity caused by the tightening of financial conditions. That's exactly what central banks are attempting to do. And I'm more worried about that organic slowing than I think I am about currency markets today. So Matt was asking you the question of whether or not we've properly priced in the Fed. Is you, are you essentially saying what we haven't properly priced in is what the earnings picture is going to look like going forward? I think it's a bit of both. To answer Matt's question, I'd say no, investors haven't priced in the full Fed tightening. And to your point, I think they've also perhaps underestimated some of the economic weakness. Putting both of those forces together, it's a reason to go underweight equities, perhaps tactically at the asset allocation level, to go underweight fixed income out of perhaps some concern over spread risk. Really, we think lower volatility, real asset alternatives such as infrastructure, commodities, natural resource stocks, those types of elements we think hold the most appeal tactically as you see demand for diversifying low volatility asset classes. All right, uh, uh, Todd, thanks so much for joining us. Todd Jablonski there of Principal Global Investors talking about what is and isn't priced in after the big slide that we've seen and the big shock that interest rate rises across uh, the globe from central banks ha have, have provided to markets. Coming up, Jeff Kendrick joins us, Standard Chartered Head of Crypto and EMFX. We'll talk about the gains that we've seen in Bitcoin as well. Yesterday, Bitcoin was up even with um, a, a rising dollar today. The dollar's off, and that's giving Bitcoin even more of a boost. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with former Council of Economic Advisors Chairman Jason Furman. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. I thought markets would be concerned about the banking and raising rates, and that would support the sterling. But now we've switched to an emerging market style crisis. Even with rising interest rates in the UK, it's becoming less attractive to investors as this crisis goes on. And therefore, I think we break through parity in cable uh, before Christmas, uh, probably by the end of November. What a festive gift for those earning pounds. That's Jordan Rochester, a currency strategist at Nomura, of course, sharing his view on the weakness in the pound. Joining us now is Jeff Kendrick, head of crypto and also emerging markets FX at Standard Chartered. And I'm perhaps quite provocatively going to start with a question to an emerging markets FX guest, Jeff, around the pound. Um, how, we ha we've had lots of people drawing that parallel. Would you like to draw that parallel between the EMFX world and what we're seeing in UK assets? It is very concerning when you see gilt sell off like Friday and yesterday, and the currency falling 10% as well. Uh, that's that's what we tend to see in high yield EM uh, markets, like traditionally in the sort of Russias of the world, the Turkeys of the world, et cetera, when you get both bonds and FX weakening dramatically. In the UK's case, it does make some sense, given the UK needs to attract funding. And what the market has said in the last 48 or so trading hours is uh, where we were on Friday, um, in dollars or other global um, currencies, UK assets were too expensive um, to attract that funding. So in dollar terms or in um, euro terms, for example, um, the price of gilts has fallen dramatically now uh, in the last 48 or so trading hours. Can you think of anything um, to which this is comparable, Jeff? I mean, the, the rise in rates, UK rates that we've seen is um, more severe than anything on Bloomberg records. Yeah, I mean, it certainly goes back beyond uh, most of our careers uh, when you get two-day moves like this. Um, obviously, you had the early 90s FX type issues in, in the UK. This time around, I think the probability of Bank of England trying to intervene on FX is very, very low. Um, quite frankly, the amount of reserves the Bank of England have um, wouldn't be enough to stem the slide if, if, if cable kept falling. Um, market now is obviously guessing that there'll be more rate hikes instead. Um, it's very likely there'll be 100 basis points at the next meeting. 
some disappointment yesterday that the bank didn't uh, intervene into meeting and they signalled that they probably won't. Um, so obviously it, it, it'll depend how markets play out over the next few weeks, how the inflation data comes in, et cetera. But at least today we're seeing some um, stability and that's probably helping global bond markets um, be a bit little more stable as well. So we're seeing Treasury, for example, a bit lower too. Is it fair to compare um, this to the 1970s? We were talking earlier about the IMF coming in with, a, I think, a $3.9 billion loan to it was a labor government at the time in 1976, and someone has called in to make sure we're aware of that. But of course, the whole bailout at that time was widely attributed to the 1972 program, conservative program of spend for growth. Um, and this seems to ring a lot of the same bells for me. Can you see similar comparisons? C could Quasi Quartang turn around? One thing that's definitely similar to the 70s and early 80s is that people are again talking about the so-called misery index, which is unemployment plus inflation. We know where inflation is, unemployment rates are low, um, and unemployment rates need to go higher globally and probably in the UK quite dramatically so for the bank to get inflation under control, particularly given what the currency has done in the last couple of days. Yeah. And as a result of that, you're starting to see bond markets invert globally. And in the UK, we're seeing that already. Well, Jeff, as we see currencies that seem to be moving out of control, out of the control of, of central banks and policymakers, uh, turning to your crypto purview, does that actually build the case for something like Bitcoin? I was joking earlier that uh, crypto is becoming the safe haven asset in the UK, given what Gilts <laughs> and, and Sterling are doing. But more seriously, um, I suspect we have seen the lows uh, in crypto. Um, you could argue that perhaps we've seen most of Fed uh, hype pricing priced in, and therefore the likes of the NASDAQ may have seen the lows as well. You could argue that perhaps you need to have lower earnings expectations, given the likelihood of um, global growth slow down, but at some point the Fed will also be beyond um, its sort of peak pricing, if you like, and we think that's quite soon in terms of US rate markets in particular. And so risk assets probably trade okay. In crypto itself, earlier this year we had issues like the Terra Luna collapse, that's yeah. behind us now, so markets are much cleaner. And we also had at the same time Bitcoin miners bringing coins onto exchange and selling those partly linked to uh, energy prices, for example, because they needed that cash. And that stopped as well. Um, mm. So actually within the crypto market, things are looking a bit more constructive. And we're now past the sort of um, up and down story around the Ethereum merge uh, right. as well. So I think we've seen the lows. OK, so maybe we've seen the lows, but I'm wondering what actually would be a catalyst for a new breakout higher, considering with Bitcoin specifically, we've seen just a move in $10,000 increments, first stuck in a range around 40000 then 30000 Now we've been around the 20000 level really since the end of June. Where realistically can we go by year end? I think the next level is 25000 to the top side. Um, I mean, obviously, crypto markets are very volatile, so I'm not going to say that happens today, tomorrow, next week, year end, et cetera. But I think that's the next topside level for us to look out for. Um, if the Nasdaq can go sideways and if investors start thinking about those medium term opportunities, given how cheap crypto has become, I think that's very achievable. That would probably be Ethereum up towards 2000 again by year. And I think is a reasonable target right now for both of those crosses. And then we start to consider whether or not reserve managers um, that have been hurt or scared by what's happened with the Russian central bank reserves earlier this year, start to consider crypto as a medium-term diversifying tool as well. If that happens, I think the top side in 2023 could be significant. All right, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Jeff Kendrick there of Standard Chartered talking to us about the incredible volatility that we've seen in UK assets and beyond. Tune in, by the way, for the beyond to Bloomberg Crypto. That's today and every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. This week, we're going to hear from, and this is the big one, folks, billionaire <laughs> Sam Bankman-Fried, an interview you don't want to miss. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, Volkswagen is likely to price the Porsche IPO at the top end 
of an initial range, according to deal terms seen by Bloomberg. It's a sign of how much demand there is for the share sale, even amidst these horrendous markets. VW is expected to set the IPO price on Wednesday tomorrow, with Porsche shares to begin trading the day after on Thursday. Christoph Rauwald, our Frankfurt bureau chief, joins us now for more. So, Christoph, it's... I mean, it's not unbelievable that there's so much demand for these shares, right? Because the brand is so strong and the margins are so fat for a car maker, but they're still not Ferrari levels. No, they're not, they're not quite Ferrari uh, levels. At the same time, uh, Porsche, as a, as a brand and as, a, as an operation, has proven that they can actually navigate like difficult market environment, including a recession, relatively well. They have a pretty strong pricing uh, point in the market. They have a, a sort of like broad global diversification of their sales. They're pretty big in China. It's the biggest market for them. Pretty, pretty big in the U.S. Third biggest market is Europe. So from a, like a geographical point of view, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's some balance in the system so they can navigate uh, usually crisis pretty well. Mm, yeah, so ge geographical diversification helps, Christoph, but at least two of those three areas um, that you mentioned troubled either by COVID regulations or by energy crises. Has this given VW pause for thought at all when it comes to the timing of doing this IPO? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very obvious that the market environment is really, really difficult. I mean, you, you mentioned some, some of the factors. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a pretty dramatic decision, uh, situation in, in Europe at the moment when it comes to energy markets. Uh, all, all these headwinds still have not deterred Volkswagen and Porsche from pursuing that deal. And so far, investor demand has been pretty strong. And uh, yeah, as Matt mentioned earlier, uh, it, it looks as if the deal will go ahead and they will be able to price the stock at the, at the very high end of the, of the targeted range. So is there really nothing that could get in the way of this beginning to trade on Thursday? I mean, what is the likelihood that this IPO does indeed falter in some way? We're not seeing any any, any like immediate risk. Uh, uh, investor demand is, is is very very strong, and I think one factor that actually plays into the in, into the equity story at the moment is that when you look into like alternative investment opportunities, uh, you, you've got very strong swings on the bond market. The currency market are very complicated, and within the equities market, uh, if you do want to invest some money. That is an asset where you think, well, you, you do have some, 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 some form of like stability uh, and, and a proven track record of like navigating volatile market environment. So from a, from a current point of view, it looks as if the deal does go ahead. All right. Bloomberg's Christoph Rawald in Frankfurt. Thank you so much. We'll be looking to that debut later on this week. Now, as for what's ahead later on today, Bank of England chief economist Hugh Pill will be speaking on a panel at the CEPR Barclays Monetary Policy Forum. That's at 7 a.m. New York time. Plus, UK labor leader Keir Starmer will be speaking at the party conference at 9 a.m. New York time. And we'll be getting some economic data here in the U.S. as well, including consumer confidence and new home sales. But really, Matt, it is going to be the UK where my attention is focused, especially on what kind of messaging comes out from Mr. Pill regarding the fiscal policies announced in the UK over recent days and the resulting reaction in the markets when the Bank of England yesterday says, yes, we're watching, we'll assess further, look out for November. I wonder if Mr. Pill kind of repeats that message today. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I was listening to Jamie Rush we had on the program uh, earlier. He was on Bloomberg Radio saying um, the fact that the Bank of England did not come out with a surprise rate hike yesterday didn't uh, announce an interbank meeting is maybe the BOE putting the ball back in Treasury's court. So um, now maybe Quasi Quartang can amend the mini budget um, to a more medium sized uh, budget with mm -hmm. a little bit less spending or at least explain more the funding, the financing for that uh, borrowing they're going to be doing. Yeah, because as it stands at the moment, we have to wait till November 23rd, don't we, to get the details of fiscal sustainability, which the government insists they're committed to, but we don't have the detail. And we have to wait until, uh, well, all the way through October to get a Bank of England rate uh, hike as well. So a lot to watch on the UK. Good to see some US data out today, though. Something else to talk about <laughs> a little bit later on and into tomorrow's programming. That is it for Early Edition. More surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.